Hello, all you fine brownies and Pegasus sisters. Welcome to the MBS show. I am your temporary host, Silver Quill, the man, the myth, the hippogriff. And no, I have not been through any mind-altering waters or gone personality change. I'm chaotic neutral no matter what. And joining me today is podcaster and planeswalker extraordinaire, Norman Sanzo. Doom has finger lasers! Which is where he gets all the sweet rays. Yes. Now give Doom all your ponies! Yeah, are the ponies! Yes, all the ponies. Dr. Doom wants all the ponies. Well, here, we can we can start by giving you our mascot. Say hello to Sapphire Hearthstone. Hi! Wait, you're giving me away, Silver! <laughs> you're, on a, you're on a rent-to-own policy, which sounds terrible now that I say it. You don't love me anymore! Oh, maybe I have been through a little bit of evil. Doom think this is normal. Probably. And speaking of uh, making judgments on evil, we have Sketchy the Changeling. Hide your mares. Oh my. Cause Sketchy is here. Oh, okay. So apparently I'm going to give Sapphire to Dr. Doom to hide her from Sketchy, who apparently is maybe kind of sort of evil. Don't know. Does that all sound good? I'm like, I'm like LT Gray. I just, I do what, what suits me best. <laughs> Only I'm not Hispanic. <laughs> oh my. Oh and, my. And yes, I know that show. And if you haven't noticed, we're kind of talking about good and evil because we're about to see when good ponies go bad. As we talk about IDW's comic series, issues 43 through 45, known as the Ponies of Dark Water. You think so, they would name this after the good, the bad, and the pony, but no. Yeah, this isn't Western themed. Although, the, if you're like me and actually remember the Pirates of Dark Water, this is very much a, a different sort of story. So... Before we go any further, please know that we're wading hip deep into spoilers and may go in over our heads. So if you've not read the comics, you should go and do that and then come back. We'll be here for you. We're always here for you. With that said, let us begin with this story of corruption. For as the main six return from yet another adventure where they saved everybody, uh, they take a break in a hot spring. But this hot spring has apparently magical properties where it inverts their personalities so that all the traits that they show good and kindness suddenly become selfish and cruel, and they are now a threat to Equestria. Well, actually Ponyville, but who's counting that? They're on their way to dooming Equestria. First Ponyville, then the world. The world. Of course! Let's go with opening impressions and guests first. Sketchy, what would you think of this here comic? Well... I'm going to be honest with you guys. Going into this, I was not expecting much because for those who like to follow who writes and does the art for each arc, this arc was done by, the writing was done by Tom Zoller and the art was done by Tony Fleeks. Now, I like Tony Fleeks as an artist, but there are times where he where his work kind of gets a little bit sloppy. And the last time he worked together with Tom Zoller was in uh, Night of the Living Apples. And... I, that was one of, 2015 overall was not a very good year for the MLP, but Night of the Living Apples was one of the worst ones, like, and Tom Zoller doesn't really have a good track record because he did the Twilight Micro, so, yeah, so I was really not looking forward to this, especially knowing that it was going to be three months of this, but when I actually read it, I was like, wow, not only did Tom Zoller step his game up, but so did uh, Tony Fleeks uh, also put some polish into his work, and it ended up looking really good. So opening impressions of this comic, a very, very pleasant surprise. One of the biggest surprises of the, of last year when it comes to the comics. And that's very good. Glad to hear it. Norman, what did you think of this thing overall? Well, after finishing... Um... Issue 42, which was the Pinkie Pie and Rarity makes a comic book or a storybook. Uh, going into this one, I was, how would I put this? I, I was going in blind, not knowing what to expect. After reading the whole thing and finishing it, it was pretty good. It was awesome. The whole scenario of inverting your virtues is fun. It's always fun. It's always fun when you question your character's virtue. Uh, they do it all the time in D&D. It's really fun. Question everything. True that. And over here, what they did was genius. But the whole 
feel of the comic, it did feel rushed here and there, but it's to be expected in a My Little Pony comic. But overall, first impressions, I do enjoy it. Excellent, excellent. And Safi, what did you think? Evil rarity is evil. Also obsessed with fashion like holy mother of Pearl? joy and goodness. I don't know. I can't say. Mother Teresa. Holy mother of Teresa. Sure, let's go with that. Like, I, I don't know why. Rarity was the best part of this comic for me. I um, must rule the world with fashion! Evil Rarity is bae. <laughs> Very that, bad. But she, that she's cape awesome. she's wearing. You know Why that are you wearing that mask? I messed up my eyeliner. <laughs> yeah, but you know what that mask is made of? What? Children's Broken Dreams? No, it's made of waifu material. <laughs> I walk a lonely world. <laughs> oh, wow. Apart of broken dreams. So, Mr. Hostman, how do you want to tackle this arc? Mm-hmm. Well, I want to first. I want to say that I greatly enjoyed it. Uh, I thought it was fun. I love the question of how the water influenced him, influenced the ponies, and what it means. Magical pollution. Magical pollution. I will say that the when you need him, the ending <laughs> is a bit rushed. In some ways, I'm grateful for a three act structure over four, but pacing has always been the comics' Achilles heel. Solutions and resolutions are often very swift. Mm -hmm. so, and we'll, we'll get more into that as we go. But rather than tackle this each page by page, because that, you guys would be here for the next three hours or so. Lots to do. Lots to talk about. We're going to tackle this by themes. Ergo, we're going to look at the big picture. And so, so this is your last warning to avoid spoilers. We got things to talk about. And so we start with our ponies coming back from Abyssinia. Abyssinia, which is, I don't really know what that's supposed to be. Actually, I think that was a real place in fiction. <laughs> a real place in fiction. Yep. Well, yet yeah, an actual his, fictional history, you know, referenced before. Abyssinia may refer to uh, the Ethiopian Empire. Oh, it might have been a real, real place. The Ethiopian Empire, which was historically known as Abyssinia, it's a nation that comprised the northern half of present-day Ethiopia. Well, the more you, there you go. know. They went to Ethiopia. Are there any Ethiopian bronies listening to this uh, podcast? I don't know. Maybe. I don't know. Silver's calling you out. Put in the link below, yo. But in any case, they come upon a hot spring. And if this were an anime, I would be expecting a great deal of fan service right now. But Silver, they ain't wearing any clothes. Well, I mean, considering how most artists like to draw and throw Fluttershy, uh. myself included, yeah. <laughs> but they don't wear any clothes. But Doom approve. So basically, the opponents decide to have a soak. And here's where things go wrong. Because the next day, they're all acting evil. Or at least evil. mildly inconvenient. I think it only right to ask our panel, what was your favorite evil pony? Twilight. Like, I to, like, go over. I have to think over each one. Like Applejack, um, may, she's like middle. Of, she was like middle of the road for me. Uh, Rainbow Dash was, uh, honestly, really kind of there. forgettable. I think it would have to be a tie between um, Fluttershy and Rarity because I like Rarity for all the reasons that Sapphire said, and plus with her her banter with Luna when they're fighting, that's awesome. Mm. But also, I really like Fluttershy because um, the way she acts kind of gives me Poison Ivy vibes, <laughs> and I love it. Like, like she is with animals what Poison Ivy is with plants, and I thought that was really cool. And that kind of ties into one of my favorite things about this arc, but we got to have everybody say their favorites uh, first. So I'm going to hold on to that little idea for now. Mm -hmm. All right, Sefi. You you sound eager to chime in. What what's your favorite villain? Rarity. Por qué? <laughs> por qué? <laughs> did did you just say por qué? Yes. For See. what reason? Okay. I I don't know why. Rarity is just the goofiest of all of the villains in in this 
particular story arc, and I love it. Like, Twilight, oh, I'm the smartest mare in the world, and I shall take over the world because of that. Rarity, though, she's like, no, I'm gonna take down Princess Twilight because fashion! How dare her five-year-old haircut think she can rule the world? I must rule the world and make it fabulous! Of I love course. it. <laughs> Oh my gosh. It's not really like she's my favorite villain when it comes to, like, you know, the actual villainy part. She's my favorite because her reasons, her motivations are just so goofy and I love it. Maybe I've been watching a bit too much Sham and Max. I don't know. And Norman, what what was your favorite villain du jour? Hmm. Well, I wanted to say Twilight, but Fluttershy comes in at a close second. Um, the reason why Twilight is because... She almost did it. She was outsmarted everyone. She she had contingency plan upon contingency plans. Like she predicted stuff and it happened. Like the key of a true villain is almost winning. And Twilight almost won. <laughs> Sha winning. <laughs> what about you, Silva? Well, I'm gonna give it to Fluttershy, if only because seeing her take on this this queen of the flies sort of aspect, mm-hmm. except the flies are actual a- bigger animals. Uh, she was probably the most threatening, had the most physical force behind her. And it's true that Twilight was the smartest. She could have come close, but she also was inactive for much of the period. Fluttershy was the, the biggest and most immediate threat, with Rarity as a close second. Mm. I agree with Safi that Rainbow was just sort of out of the way for most of the comic. She was a yeah. I'm surprised that nobody mentioned Luna. Well, well, yeah, but Luna wasn't exactly like evil throughout. Like she was temporarily evil for the sake of a good cliffhanger. Well, tr- it felt like true, but still, you got Nightmare Moon and the implication of that happening. Like, think about it this way: if Celestia were to hit down, what would we get? Like, I always have that wishful thinking that, uh, man, Celestia would be awesome. We get to see an evil version of her, and then, like, yeah, man, that'll be awesome. Night- Nightmare Star. Uh, it'll be Sunburst something, 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 something. Well, but let's, let's also look at the villainous, uh, characters, because in a lot of ways they are send-ups to previous comic villains. Rarity, I think we've all made the Doctor Doom analogy. Yep. Pink, Pinkie Pie's rocking the Joker. Mm-hmm, true. Uh, yep. The Fluttershy has a Poison Ivy vibe to her. Rainbow Dash is just exploding everywhere, so... Yeah, she's just showing yeah, off. I can't really say that there's a... Uh, I can't say that I know a villain that Rainbow might be an homage towards. Well, Unless those flight goggles are are an indication of anything, uh, I don't think everything needs to be a reference to something. Because when yeah, you, not really. When you take a look, see at Applejack. Like, what is she? She's just loot and plunder. Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> no, I'm serious. Uh, Captain Planet villain. I know. Yes, I watched that show. <laughs> loot she... and plunder. That's yeah. what she is. She's loot and plunder. Yes. <laughs> just a just a scummy business person who doesn't care about anyone but herself. That is kind of what Loot and Plunder was. Why is John Tron playing in my head singing the Captain Planet theme song? It is kind of a reach, though. A little bit, but but then I don't know what... What is that scarf on Twilight supposed to be? I'm not sure if it's supposed to really like, be so far? anything I don't specific. Know. I don't know. It just seems like with, with such very strong <laughs> references for some of the ponies, it feels weird that the rest are just sort of, eh, whatever. Yeah, probably. I don't know. I mean, it could be a bad Sonic OC. <laughs> Oh no! No! Oh, she sh- she shadow the twilight. <laughs> shadow the twilight, or no. or she's potentially Eggman, except Eggman. No, Eggman's much more cheerful. Eggman. He's much cheerful and bubbly than that. Oh god! Imagine if they made Twilight like Bella from Twilight. Oh, oh my god! So she just stares at everyone, kind of slack jawed, and puts herself in harmful situations just to get attention. She has no problem with with Spike watching her while he while she sleeps. Oh no! She thinks it's romantic. Keeps throwing herself <laughs> off off rooftops so Flash Sentry will catch her. So with the um whole idea of these different versions of the main six, 
that kind of leads to one of the things I love about this arc is that um, one of the things that kind of uh, I didn't really like about how people kind of thought about the main six was that all they were were their elements. Like I mentioned in um, other instances that I kind of get a little miffed when people try to oversimplify these characters, those main those main things and how season four was genius for lampshading that and showing that they're more than that. And one of the things that I was worried about was that we would just have another instance of the, the discord in main six where it's like, Oh, okay. So they're just the opposite of the elements of harmony. How creative. But with this, it's a little more nuanced than that because instead of just making them the opposites of whatever their element was, they took a key aspect about them and twisted it so that it's more malicious. For example, Fluttershy loves animals. And now it's twisted into she has to, she is the self-appointed guardian of the animals and anyone who is a threat has to be eliminated. With Twilight, Twilight is a mare that is passionate about knowledge, the pursuit of knowledge. Now it's been twisted into an obsession with being the most knowledgeable in the world and ruling over everyone who was, who she saw as beneath her. And then with Applejack, she, uh, has a passion for her family business, but instead of her passion being because of it's because it's a family business, now she's passionate about it because of the business aspect of it. And she, cares less about uh integrity and and looking out for your family in exchange for being more concerned about profits and and spending the least amount of money while making the most so i feel as though it was a lot more creative for them to do this although like rainbow dash is like the exception because she she was kind of there she didn't really do anything but for the most part I do think that it was a really good way to tackle this. And then it ends up tying into the next three-parter, Chaos Theory, when they talk about how it's not our desires that make us bad, but rather how we reach for them. But uh, that would be a discussion for whenever you guys do Chaos Theory. But the, the fact that this does tie into a later arc and they use how well they portrayed the 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 Dark Six, let's call them the Dark Six because it's Dark Water, how the Dark Six are portrayed really works in the story's favor. I agree with that. It is nice. How to describe this? One of the analogies I come up with reading this is that Marvel had a similar series, Axis, where good and bad characters flipped their alignment, so to speak. But it was not very well done because they basically said, oh, we're evil now. Just, just that. That's all it was. Mm-hmm. Uh, this one, it presents that they, they're still themselves, but they've lost something. They've lost empathy. They've lost care for others. And I'm curious, what does this, so often in the show, they just say, oh, we turned you good. We turned you, you stopped being evil. Well, that's rather arbitrary. I deeply resent the idea that you can just drain evil away from someone as if it's just an oil change. However, towards the end, in the final part, the, the ponies were now suddenly saying, Oh, Luna, you are better as Nightmare Moon. Well, why? Oh, I like myself better now. I'm much, I'm much more evil. Well, no, no, now you're, now you're starting to twirl your mustaches and just talk about the glory of being evil. That's undermining it. I feel like just towards the end, this comic started to lose some of the, the commentary it, it had perhaps inadvertently started. Yeah, it does kind of lose a little bit of its theming. Um, it does gain a little bit of it back towards the very end where um Luna is, you know, talking about how, you know, they were all like having to defeat them was a challenge and they were lucky that having having the water twist their person not their personalities but rather their uh their approach to their motivations. They were fortunate that it also disbanded their friendship because if they had worked together, they would have been near unstoppable. 
True. Yeah. And leaving l- leaving them to just think on that and marinate on that. That kind of hit me. It was like, because now Luna's got me thinking about it. Like, whoa, they did work together. Yeah. And this all goes back to why Twilight and her friends are important in the MLP Gen 4 timeline. Like, Starlight Glimmer has been asking, why are you so important? You're just a pony. You're not. Because plot armor. <laughs> that I swear. I swear, if you get kidnapped by changelings, I'm not coming to save you. Again. <laughs> no, but it does bring up a point here, because think about it. One of the things that in the recent comic arc, uh, what was that? The Accord comic? Yeah. They, they highlighted this, and they also highlighted the other six in the Mirror Universe. Oh, the reflection, yes. yeah. And the only difference between... Um, our bad guys here and the bad guys over there is that they don't have the motivation. They're not really friends. They're just acquaintances. Or at least they hang out together. Yeah, but we, as, over here, they, it's clearly stated that if they were to work together, if they were to just, well, uh, set their difference aside, they could have conquered the world. Of course. Of course. Of course. Of course. <laughs> okay, have we all done the meme? Yep. Everybody got yes. the meme? We're on meme yep. now? Yep. <laughs> okay, I really meme it. <laughs> Stop being so mean. <laughs> uh, but. Why you gotta be so mean? <laughs> uh, boys. But anywho, uh, what else are we leaving out? Because that's the main six. But what about individually? Aside from the main six, I think that one of the major, another one, Luna and how she ties into all this because uh personally and I say this as a Luna fan mind you before you get your pitchforks I do think that them bring the story bringing every story that where Luna plays a major role just has to bring up the fact that Nightmare Moon that she wasn't that she used to be Nightmare Moon like it, it kind of I feel like it kind of stagnates her because, like, if we have to bring up her past every time she's the she's one of the main characters, it's like, what else? Shank, what else do we expect her to do? And a lot of the times when they do bring it up, it's her wallowing in her in her misery about it. <laughs> but now we have a story where I feel like it's done well because instead of her feeling she is, she acknowledges that this happened and she's using the these experiences and these lessons to help out others that are going through this same thing. So I feel as though um, Luna was used uh, very effectively here. Mm-hmm. Uh, the only difference between characters here, like Luna wants to help, but the ponies themselves, the, I mean, the evil six here, they don't want to. They say that they can, cle- that they can think clearer now. They're much, They're in a much better state of mind where they're more powerful, they're more focused, they're more, well, just, I, I think this is the span of two or two, three days where Applejack almost conquered almost of all of the Apple estate of family things. Uh, Pinkie Pie imprisoned or had captive guests while Rainbow Dash just keeps doing Sonic Booms. Now put in the Guile team and we'll have an awesome soundtrack. Sonic Boom, Sonic Boom. Ah, nuts to you. Sonic Boom, Sonic Boom, Sonic Boom. Oh, yeah, that was a cartoon now. Yeah, it was. No. Yeah, Sonic Boom. It is. No, it was for Sonic, uh, Sonic... <laughs> Sonic CD. Yeah, Sonic CD. But Sonic Boom's not bad. Well, there's also a, a cartoon out now called Sonic Boom. <laughs> the so- it's the Sonic- actually pretty good. I know, right? High five. I don't know. Sorry, guys, but for me, it's... Sonic, the comics have ended. I feel like Sonic is slipping further away. Come back, Sonic. Hey, guys, read. Hey, Knuckles, read this. <laughs> hey, wait a minute. Okay, let me get my glasses. <laughs> the last I checked, oh, wait, I can't read. Comic, <laughs> Sally somehow became a robot? Uh, we can talk about the Sonic comics in a good time, but we're getting off the topic. Mm-hmm. Because uh, I, do, I do like the, the commentary, especially when Applejack is arguing with uh, Luna, saying that she's better now. And... I, it's interesting to think if you could shut off your empathy, you might feel that you're liberated, that suddenly you can commit to just a choice of action without having to worry. But I'd argue that 
you're really being happy that you're incomplete, that you're missing an aspect. And this is kind of relevant to what I see going on a lot in the nation. You guys, uh, you guys heard about Milo Yiannopoulos, right? Um, sorry, not me. He was an editor for Breitbart, right? Yeah, he worked for that for a time, and he gained notoriety as he began to push back against political correctness, uh, was very much anti-trans, really a, a very awful person in my eyes. But a lot of people were attracted to him because he always was saying, oh, your feelings don't matter. And people think that's liberating. They think, wow, I'm attracted to a rebel who tells it like it is. Until you realize that, one, the rebel's not really telling it like it is. He's just being a jerk. And ultimately, that lack of empathy seems to be their downfall. Now, who does that remind you of? Let's not even go there. But yeah. <laughs> honestly, maybe people... But the point I'm trying to make with this comic is that it presents the characters as saying they're somehow more free because they no longer care about others. But... That's just a skewed perspective from someone who is missing a critical part of what makes people whole. I kind of feel you on that because when you lose a sense of empathy, you think that, oh, because I don't have to care about anybody else, that means I can focus all my attention on myself and be a better me, but then you realize how wrong that is. Yeah, you're never a better you when you stop caring about others. It just means you've shut down some of your best qualities. And so that's that's an important thing. But then, look, again, the comic at the end where it, it – after each of the main six is restored to themselves, like, oh, my mind was thinking this. I couldn't control it. Oh, it was awful. It's like, okay, you, you've, you've shown us through the actions. I don't think we really need the play-by-play. Well, I think they do kind of need the – what were in their mindset. But if everybody was saying it, like, yeah, redundancy. Redundancy. Let's talk about the other heroes for a sec. The Cutie Mark Crusaders. And Spike. And Spike. And Zakora. And... And the plot device, yes. That kind of led to one of the things that disappoints me about this comic is... um, And this kind of ties into just my disappointment with Zakora as a character because I like Zakora and I want to... I really want her to be the great character that I used to think that she was. But now that I think of it, every time she plays a major role in a story, it's always, she always needs to be an assistant to someone else. She's always the solution to a problem. Like, every time something happens, it's like, get Sakura, get Sakura, get Sakura. And it's like, can she do something else other than be a solution to someone's problem? Could she ever be the one with the problem? Exactly. That has always been her role. The mentor type where... Oh, what was it? The shaman type, the mentor to most of the ponies here because, well, how do I put this? Like, I, I, I agree with you guys here, but just because I'm playing devil's advocate, she here, like, she has all the answers, which I don't agree at all. Like, how does she know everything? Yeah, I, I feel you on the whole thing about her. Yeah, she has to be the mentor, but when they just make... Like there's a, I feel like there's a line between being a mentor and just being the person that provides the salute because like she doesn't mentor anybody. It's it's Luna who's dealing with all the who has all the experience to to say that hey I understand where you're coming from but this is not the way. Zakora is just for all intents and purposes she's just a tool. Yeah. To be to, to be completely. I, I know it sounds funny, but I'm being I, 100% I know. serious. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. She, like, not in, like, the derogatory, like, in the literal sense that she is a tool. She is a means to an end. She yeah. is not a character well, take the in case, this. She's the deus ex machina. Deus ex machina? Uh-huh. Deus ex You owe me a soda. <laughs> uh, no, you owe me soda. I'm not sure if it's deus ex machina because they don't, it doesn't solve everything and you still, and once she provides the cure, you still need to, administer it it was it wasn't it wasn't able to just cure everything in one go you still have to put a little bit of effort True. into it but she was definitely used as a means to an end rather than as an actual character and i feel as though this is something that i've been noticing more and more as i think about zakora and it sucks because i feel as though there's a lot of potential with her and with her just being shoehorned into this role where she just dispenses the solution without being an actual character 
it is kind of disappointing as someone who used to have her in as my number one supporting character in the show that she's re- she has been reduced to this. Yeah, it, it's sad to see Zakura not playing a bigger part. Like I do hope that season seven changes that. But for what we got here, it's pretty interesting. Like Zakura here, like didn't really play that big of a part except the brewer to brew the antidote and find the answer and whatnot. But overall, Zakura was wasted. But the CMC though, they're pretty awesome. They're they're running around a lot. They, as I think it was Apple who said, at least we're getting our cardio. Yep, yep. And you know what? Uh, for almost the end of chapter forty three, um, I do enjoy. I do highly enjoy the part where Luna just says, "Spike, you come with me." CMCs, you go into the dangerous forest where big giant animals can kill you in one swipe. Good luck. Yeah, he is. I wrote, I drew a comic just pointing out the absurdity of all that. I gotta say, the, the delegation of tasks in this, you've got the whole of Ponyville caught up in this, but only three fillies and a, a dragon and a zebra and an alicorn princess are, are trying to fix things. The rest of Ponyville is once again reduced to, uh, spectators and victims. And part of, it's like we talked about with To Wear and Back Again. It's refreshing when other ponies get to help save the day. I wish that this comic had given the pony villains a chance to step up and repay the main six for all the times they've helped save them. Yeah, I, I do agree with that statement there because it's the perfect time to gather all the ponies and make them help. Like, even if they didn't help or they failed to help, it was still awesome. But by looking at the timeline here, probably the citizens of Ponyville were just thinking that, oh, um, the main six are just being silly and stupid. Like, ignore them. They're just doing their usual shenanigans. Shenanigans! Shenanigans! Although maybe there is that point. At some point, Ponyville just becomes desensitized. Yep. Oh, look, another rampaging bunch of bunnies. Is Applejack on the rush again? Yeah. Well, is this a friendship problem or a monster problem? Usually it'll be finished in 22 minutes. <laughs> oh, I hope that monster will go away, but I don't know. At some point, it's like that Powerpuff Girls episode where the girls stop saving the day to see how the town reacts. Oy. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that was silly. Powerpuff Girls, we need you. Oh, maybe. Oh, I don't know. Figure it out yourself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I remember that one. Yeah, me too. That that was a great episode. <laughs> but uh, there's not a lot of emotional impact. I mean, Spike and the CMC have all lost family to this. Uh, and it doesn't ever seem to really impact them. Well, yeah, here's my view on this. They could have this thing where they have in their mind that, oh, uh, we solved the problem. It's all going to be good. So let's just keep stick to the plan and find a solution. It'll all be good. True, but I do think, uh, I can, I can kind of see where Silver is coming from in that if there was a little bit more emotional investment from the CMC and Spike, that we could get a better sense of how desperate the situation is and how the sense of, uh, we have a better sense of urgency and impact in how these characters are affected by the way that their loved ones are acting. Like, especially like, like with Scootaloo, like she looks up to Rainbow Dash, you know. I feel as though out of all the, out of the CMC and Spike, I feel as though Scootaloo has, um, the biggest mental image of their older sibling, if, if that's making sense. Like they all, they all look up to them in some way, but Scootaloo has the most, I guess, inflated Im- uh, image of, Ra- of her older sibling. So, the more inflated it is, the more it hurts when it's broken. I think that also would have helped to make Rainbow Dash have a better impact in this story by seeing how the realization that she's turned bad affects Scootaloo. So by having Scootaloo be more emotionally invested, it could in, it could uh, indirectly help Rainbow Dash's impact to the story. If any of that made any sense. Well, uh, it, does. Uh, yeah, it, does, it does. It does. Well, we haven't talked about Spike a lot. Spike here did also jump into the pool, but he's not affected. 
magical dragon scale get out of jail free card. Mm, dragon scale, dragon scale. Oh God, no, sketchy. Why? Uh, Go to the corner now. Although it's kind of funny that this harkens back to uh, Spike and Sakura's friends forever, mm-hmm. where it's like the, he thinks, "Well, is it because I'm a dragon? Oh, what? I'm not good enough to turn evil because I'm a dragon?" <laughs> <laughs> No, well, maybe it's is. good to turn evil because you're a dragon. No. I, I just like the line, let me take Spike aside and see if the solution is in his hide. It's like, I need an adult? That's, oh my god. Oh, come to the bat cave, Robin. <laughs> oh, wow. Hmm. So, Zukura, oh. that fanfic I read of you, so it's true then. Hmm. This oh is my. opening so many dark doors and I want to, and I want to go through one of them. <laughs> ah, I'm a terrible person. <laughs> Aren't we all? Yep. Well, Spike, he doesn't really get to react to Twilight being evil. And she, you know, Scootaloo looks up to Rainbow. Spike loves Twilight more than any other as a sister, I think. Mm-hmm. There are times I think Spike is more a brother to her than Shining Armor. <laughs> True. Uh, Definitely. Like, I'm in the camp that there there are people that see Twilight as a mother to Spike, and there are people that see them as as pseudo siblings and there is a fair there is fair reasoning for for both sides. I'm on more in the camp where Spike looks at her as an older sister, and I do feel you on that I do feel you on the fact that uh the notion that Spike really does love. Twilight, especially when you consider how much he values her opinion of him. We see this as early as season one, where he didn't want to be replaced. And, you know, he, it's clear that he values her, not just her, but her opinion of him. So I guess he and Scootaloo would be near tied for, um, like how much they look up to their respective siblings. And yet he's sort of just like, uh, hmm, what's going on? Why is everyone so weird? And that's just it. That's all there is to it at times. Well, he doesn't really know what happened. So I would say that his reaction there is normal. Because you True. you woke up, suddenly your quote-unquote best friend sister turns nuts. So it's like, uh, are you having some emotional baggage problem that I should know of? Like, you know? Okay, this is true, but once you get further along and you learn more about what's going on, see that, oh, wait, this is a lot worse than I thought it was, you would think that, that there would be more emotional investment. You know, uh, you know, they could, they could play on the fact that we rarely ever see Twilight and they could, they could have had something where like Spike is so desperate to go and see her and try and save her. And, you know, that could have been a great, uh, motivation for him like come on guys we gotta go I gotta get to Twilight I gotta get to Twilight You, it would have been a great opportunity to show how much he loves her true but at the same time too when you do that you'll have the dilemma of a character that sorry you, you have a character where he knows he needs to f- complete the task but because of his selfishness he doesn't really complete the task so instead of doing that like from what I see here, Spike knows that, okay, I need to create the cure because the cure will help everyone. So I have to stay on target. So uh, previously this happened, like uh, the Nightmare Rarity arc where R- Spike heads off to see Rarity. Uh, they talked. And what did Spike got? Nothing but a broken heart. And I think he was thrown off the cliff. Something like that. Well, True, he- but like... I'm not saying that he should have abandoned the task and go to see Twilight, but rather he should have had a desire to see her. Not not necessarily act upon it, but just show that he's really worried about her mm, yeah, and that, that he wants to do what he can to save her. And then he realizes that the best thing that he can do is contribute to finding the cure. So showing that desire to save her Instead of just saying, "Okay, let's do this. Let's do. Let's just make the cure," would have been, would have worked out in his favor. At least say something about it. Like, yeah, I understand what you mean. Yeah, mostly I'm I'm looking at the uh, panels you referenced, Norman, with uh, Zakura talking about Spike's hide. Oh my! 
Oh, you. One thing that strikes, this is kind of going back to Zakura being the, the font of all answers. Luna speculates maybe it wasn't the springs. That, that might have been a red herring. Mm-hmm. And Luna, uh, Zakura immediately says, no, I think it's more that uh, Spike is immune. So how do you know that? Did you read the script? <laughs> Zakura, what's that tucked in your hoof? Is that the script? Did you not learn from the last from the last time you guys had to find a cure for something? <laughs> I mean, really? Really? <laughs> Apparently. And that kind of ties back to my to my problem with with Zakora in this comic. Like she she just knew. Well, she, like she, she just had the solution. She just knew. Playing devil's advocate here, Zakura lives in a creepy forest, so the chances of her knowing stuff is high. So why not the creepy? How does that? Just, how does that, but how does that make you know stuff? Just because you live in a creepy forest, like you could live in a creepy forest, like the people, like the swamp people in Avatar, they don't know. They they know a lot about the forest, but not much else. Well, that, <laughs> like I'm saying, I'm just like, playing devil's advocate here, is, so. Like, what if I yeah. lived out of the New Jersey Turnpike? Would that make me a political <laughs> the, expert? The devil needs a better advocate then because, yeah, like, she knows a lot about the stuff in the Everfree Forest because she lives in the Everfree Forest, but it's pretty clear that the hot spring was way outside of Equestria. So Zakora is Madame Zeroni. That's all I'm <laughs> going to say. How can she know about, like... The the dark water's existence, period. Let alone how to cure it. Well, you when know? you Madam Zeroni, old <laughs> swami lady, I don't know. Well, all of uh, the core, like quote unquote, knowledge was mm-hmm. basically speculative. Yeah, true, but still, it and, just happened to be right. <laughs> and also, uh, Zakura didn't know what was going on. Her first, her first uh, reaction to the Crusaders was, "Why must you bellow? Just knock and calmly say hello." <laughs> Like, good God, children. Y- yeah, we're cool and all, but don't just barge into my house. Did you guys not watch A Friend Indeed and see how bad that turns out? <laughs> or, or just Swarm of the Century. Have you gone mad? <laughs> yeah, but but still, uh, Zakura here feels that, oh, whenever I'm on stage, there's a problem. Oh, okay, let me see. Grumble, grumble, grumble. Soft problem. There you go. Yeah, I read this through the script. Happy? <laughs> there you go. Uh, but I, I kind of diverted the conversation from Spike. But mm-hmm. honestly, the, our our B team is our acting. You know, they, they perform actions, but they're not really reacting to the situation in any emotional sense, except panic or summarizing. I mean, at the the very start of issue forty five, they basically sum up why everything is going wrong. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's a there's an eerie lack of emotional investment from side characters. There's definitely investment from Luna, but her sidekicks, not so much. Yeah, and well, they, they do address how they care for their sisters and whatnot. Like, I, I remember them addressing it, but I don't remember which panel. So, uh, well. Yeah, but the thing is, it's more than just... It's more than just saying that you're concerned. It's showing that concern. Like Luna shows a constant concern, not just in what she says, but how she acts, her facial reactions, and the way she's drawn. With the CMC and Spike, you know, yeah, they might have said it, but do they ever show it? True that. But still, it's one of those scenarios where is it the writing, the artist? I think it's a balance of both. Mm. And honestly. the pace. Mm, true. Yeah. We're, we're dealing with no less than six antagonists here, soon, and for a brief period, seven. Uh-huh. Oh, but speaking of lack of investment or involvement, Princess Celestia. <laughs> uh, what about her? Uh... I know a lot of people want to harp on Celestia for this, but, 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 mm-hmm. but. Stop talking about Celestia's hindquarters. <laughs> Look, it's it's magnificent though. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, I think this was a time where Luna needed to handle it. Like this is dealing. It, obviously, Celestia has a bad has a has a bad track record when dealing with good people that go bad. So I think Luna would be the more trusted one. Think about it this way. Imagine if they both went to take care of it and they weren't able to do so and they were able to go to Canterlot and now there's no one left. True. 
And I don't understand why Celestia chose Luna to head to Ponyville and save the Ponyvillians. Because, well, she was once from the dark side, now onto the light side, the Jedi. So she knows the temptation of darkness. But unbeknownst to her, that it was not really temptation, but by force. And what Celestia's last well, line here... Well, if you want to or... consider the Nightmare Rarity arc canon... It's that's kind of up in the air. Eh, in truth, I, I do not. It's a it's a fun story, but it's not. Yeah, because that's the whole thing about the comics is that they're B canon. They're only canon as long as they stick with the show. Mm. And I do think there are, there are a few things about the show that contradict with the Nightmare Rarity arc. Oh, don't totally thereby me. rendering it Mute. <laughs> as good as it is, mm. not really canon. I'm not sure if I would say that Luna's transformation was by force and even if we were to consider the nightmare rarity art canon the nightmare force still need still needed to feed on a genuine feeling that she had so luna did still feel feel jealousy because that jealousy had to be there for the nightmare force to take root so even if it was canon it's still not completely it's still not a completely forced transformation oh no i'm not uh, saying uh that i'm just saying that in this comic here when she got hit by the uh, dark water she turned evil instantly she didn't do it by choice but she was forced into such transformation oh i see okay yeah and the line the, the last line that celestia ever said is farewell my sister i know you i know you will perform admirably i just hope i haven't sent you back into temptation so yeah she's worried she knows but you know what let's just throw the dart let's see where it hits if it hits on the bad spot like oh gee, I did a boo-boo then like at least send two guards with her who want cake <laughs> uh Safi we've hey. been keeping we've, we haven't given you a chance to chime in on this what what do you think of the choice between sending Luna or sending Celestia uh, honestly I, I can't fault Celestia on like sending Luna I mean Yes, I know Celestia is famous for not taking the hands-on approach, if that makes any sense. Um, Hooves on, at least. Mm-hmm. Hooves on, at least. It. I, I don't think, like, Celestia could have really done anything in this situation. I think Luna was a good choice. Like, what, what do you think Celestia could contribute, Silver? Okay, I, w- I will take the stance of Celestia should have gone. Uh, and I say this as a Lunar fanboy. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm all kinds of conflicted right now. <laughs> Here's the thing. Celestia is better at inspiring others to participate. And so she could have rallied Ponyville much faster and acted with greater uh, awareness. She may not be familiar with life on the dark side, but she has spent her good deal of time resisting the dark side. So she would know counter strategies against the main six and also know how to use that against them. Plus, we're all, we're making the assumption that she wouldn't be able to contribute because, unfortunately, that's been the norm. Poor Celestia is always sidelined or brought low to show the bad guy is a threat. And it's happened so many times now that it's become almost routine. <laughs> It's, it's, an, it's an April O'Neil situation. <laughs> we have to save Celestia. What makes you think she's in trouble? Is she here? No. That she's in trouble. <laughs> uh, I, I just can't wait for, for the final Friends Forever to at least give us a sneak peek of how Celestia and Luna can really be. Well, we shall hope. But Celestia needs a chance to show her best, to remind us why she's been in charge for a thousand years. And no, I don't believe it's just because she's an alicorn. There's also the matter that Twilight and Friends have saved her so often. I hunger for the chance for her to step in and repay that. Not necessarily saving them from a world-ending threat, but for her to be there for th- be there for them when they don't know what to do, and she can give them a little guidance. That is also why Friends for uh, the my main. Blah, blah, my Little Pony number 50 was disappointing in how even Celestia couldn't even rally the strength to keep fighting. I do agree with you 
on the notion that Celestia needed needs a time for her to step up. I feel you on the idea that Celestia needs a moment where she steps up and protects her subjects. I agree, but I don't think this was the, was the story that would have been best for that. And that kind of goes back to what I said about Luna in that personally, I've been getting kind of tired of every story where she's a main character bringing up the fact that she used to be evil. But this is a, this is a time where it works. Just like how this is a time where Celestia not being involved works because Luna was a better fit in my eyes. I think that this is a, an issue of like really bad timing because this came out where the elements that were used were done well, but it's come out at a time where they've been done wrong. They've been, they've been executed poorly so many times that people are sick of it. So even though it's done well here, we're so exhausted by it that we can't really appreciate it. I see your point. This is very good. Uh, though, let's also consider one thing. They didn't know what was going on. So basically, the logic still goes, like you say, Luna, you were evil. You'll be good for this. Sister, you fought evil. You'll be good for this. Well, the last time I fought evil, I sent it to the moon. So, eh. Oh, don't even start with me. <laughs> Jeez, sis, you're such a buzzkill. What? what? I want cake. And let me have my cake. You go deal Ponyville's problem. Yeah. 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 Oh, we're back to Rainbow Dash as uh as Tristan and Ken. <laughs> yeah, yeah not Ken. Tristan Joey. Joe. Well, there you go. Some Yu-Gi-Oh character who honestly didn't do that much. <laughs> Burn the witch. <laughs> Joey did a lot. Thank you very much. Yeah, he went yeah a lot. Burn the witch. We got we got to have someone to come in third place. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I'm being harsh. I love Joey, especially in Abridged. <laughs> yeah. Everything, yeah. <laughs> uh, but let's see here. I feel like we've covered a good swath of the main characters involved, the ideas, the topics. Oh, I guess one final thing is that Sakura fixes the spring. Oh, yeah. Because, mm. again, pollution used as a means to an end. I did like the recurring joke that Twilight can't predict Pinky because she doesn't get humor. <laughs> yes. Uh, est- established in the first issue, and it's what saves Sequestria in the third issue. I also do appreciate that Twilight builds in time for gloating. That is that is great time management for villainy. Yep. Chrysalis doesn't know how to budget monologuing, which is usually her downfall. <laughs> but in all honesty here, okay, I have to ask, I have to ask. When, when looking at the part where Rarity is fighting with Twilight and suddenly Nightmare Moon pops in, like, yo, that was so cool. And then Nightmare Moon starts to monologue about, let's split up the territories. Who here think that, Okay, it's clearly obviously that Nightmare Moon is not Nightmare Moon. It's Luna in some glamour. Like, who here thinks that? I don't think it was obvious that, um, because like, wasn't Luna on her way to the castle before the cure was dispensed? So it, I think that leaves a little, it leaves a little wiggle room to say that she could have gotten there before the, before the cure was spread. Well. Or she could have gotten there after the cure was spread. So it it leaves a little wiggle room for you to believe that she didn't get there on time, but to say that she did. True, but still, when you think about it evilly, her, like, she is the type of pony or villain that doesn't like to share her toys. So what makes you think that she wants to share territories? Think about it. It was just her and Celestia. Mm Mm-hmm. And she just wanted to take what Celestia had. But now she she's work, she has other villains to compete with. And it's like, okay, I know I want control. But now other villains are fighting me for control. And they're just as determined to get it as I am. So I'm going to have to make some compromises. Well, honestly, if if I were to be uh, Nightmare Moon in this situation and I'm evil, yeah, um, I would just do this. Let Twilight and Rarity fight it out. And if Rarity is knocked out and Twilight is tired, I'll just swoop in and take the victory. I'll cash in the money in the bank. But then that leaves them open to be reformed and then she's right back to facing six heroines and her sister. I I bought into this at first because it seemed like the practical long game. 
Celestia will have to split her attention between the three, which takes heat off of Nightmare Moon. So it would make sense. I'll keep you guys in play as long as it benefits me while I plan to take you down in the long run. I was impressed and I liked the the twist that it was that Luna was cured and Nightmare Moon barely lasted two pages. Probably, but still, the most impressive part is the diagram where Twilight explains and uh, predicts the future. Wow. Yeah, like I say, she she budgets time for gloating. It's not only the gloating part, it's the part where she knew that uh, Princess Luna would be cured. Like, how would you know that, Twilight? <laughs> how does Sakura know? You just do. <laughs> I think she read through the script then. <laughs> Twilight. Oh, her step one: steal the script. <laughs> yes, the true villain plan. Uh, uh, but I believe we've we've gone through the long and the short of this arc. Uh, so I think, unless there, anyone has an extra point to bring up, I think we should move to final yeah, thoughts. Like, yeah, I think we kind of covered all the bases that we yeah. can. Uh, yeah, final thoughts. Yeah, final, final thoughts. So is this sketchy? Oh yeah, the guest has to go first. You think I would get you? Would, I would learn this by now. This being my fourth time on here, but yeah, final thoughts. I think it's a very enjoyable arc, but it is not without its problems, and it is also a victim of unfortunate timing because while it while there are certain themes that it does that it pulls off well, those same themes have been pulled off poorly so many times that it kind of weighs down on your enjoyment of it because you're so exhausted by the fact that it happens so often. However, in spite of its issues, I do think that it is a worthwhile arc and definitely definitely worth a reread if you ever feel like, eh, haven't read the comics in a while. I want to read one of my old favorites, Ponies of Dark Water. There you go. Yeah, I have to agree with Sketchy on this one. Um, I haven't read this one in a while and rereading it, brought in some enjoyment. Like, it brought me some amazing, amazing wow. It was like, ooh, that was interesting. Like, ooh, I haven't read this one in a long time. Like, ooh, this, this is good. You sound like Ric Flair. Woo! <laughs> Why not, right? Uh, but um, I, I think I'll take the uh, stand. So as for me, this comic is interesting. I do like the themes that it was going for, where subverting the main six alignment with what they do from pure good to pure evil and whatnot and it's very interesting to see what they did with this one having the cmc be the hero for the book was interesting and zakura here was uh, i wish they could have done more with her besides reading the script but the jokes in this one were pretty cool i do like that final part where tony fleece and tom Slater were talking about very intellectual things until Twilight Sparkle sucked their brain power out. And I do like that last part where both of their mother's name were Marta. Oh, why would you say that name? <laughs> I don't know. It's, uh, joke, j- uh, jokes were good. Jokes were good in this one. Uh, but still, I highly enjoy and I would recommend reading it. Safi, what are your closing thoughts? Well, considering how long this has kind of gone on, I'm just going to say, good comic, go read it. Well, Not much to say. Well, it is a three-parter, so that was warranted. And for my mm. part, I enjoyed this comic. It's a lot of fun. I love the, the villainous personalities of the main six. There are some moments where I feel like the, the characterization is going neglected just to keep a flow of events going. And I will always be on the lookout for Celestia gets to save the day for others and repay their kindness. It didn't happen this time, but it could. And that's something to keep an eye out for and hope for. Uh, I love the idea behind what makes a person go bad is sometimes an absence, but they might view it as a strength. But I also feel that the ending is a little rushed and that you don't really don't need recaps because you the, it did a pretty effective job of showing the new attitudes. But I'd recommend it. It's been a fun read, and it... Was cert- it's certainly the one I look back fondest, given the most recent arcs and all the brouhaha that arises from that. So, uh, with that, I think we will bid a fond farewell to Ponies of the Dark Water and look forward to the next event, which, Norman, what do we have coming down the pipe? 
since we're finished with season six, so technically there won't be any episode reviews. So, well, as for now, let's leave it at a blank state because who knows? Uh, we could talk about a movie. We could talk about a character. Well, discussion podcast is uh, clearly there. But probably if we're crazy enough, we'll do more comics. Who knows? Us crazy? Surely you jest. Probably, but I know who we are and we are so loco. Yep. Loco, loco in the cocoa. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, folks, once again, we want to thank Sketchy the Changeling for joining us and talking about the comics and the show in general. And thank you guys for being gracious enough, gracious enough to have me. No problem, man. It was a pleasure. Que bueno. So, for the MBS show, I am Cecil Vaquil. I am Doom with finger lasers. I want a donut. And I want several donuts. And as you can tell, we're all kind of hungry. So, we will say adios and head for the concession stand. See ya. Yay! Ooh, let's eat. That's all. Adios. Peace. Bye-bye. Etsy. Do must have his donuts. Mm. Donuts.